Okay, guys, thanks for joining us today on a Friday. I know everybody's probably itching to get out of here, especially after such a slow day. It's kind of hard to stick around to the end of the day. But one thing I want to make clear, we are recording this. I always say watch it again, especially if you're newer to options trading. And even if you are familiar with this strategy, I'm going to be throwing in some things, hopefully, that even a savvy or veteran trader will be able to have some takeaways from. So uh, without further ado, let's get on with it. This is options for intermediates too. So we've done beginner, we've done uh, beginner intermediate. Now we're on to the second phase of intermediate. And the reason why I wanted to split these up was because, you know, these are intermediate, but now we're starting to get into higher risk in a sense. Um, or it's considered higher risk. Very easy strategy to understand, especially with my rules. But at the end of the day, because it is a higher risk strategy, that is why it's kind of got to get bumped up a little bit for um, intermediates. It's a little bit intermediate to advanced, if you will. Uh, anyway, uh, let me get a couple of things out of the way real quick. My name is Eric Wilkinson. Some of you guys may recognize me from CNBC, Fox Business, or even the Wall Street Journal for my commentary on everything from economic to geopolitical and market analysis. I uh, started trading in college with some money I had earned in basically high school, middle school, and uh, was trying to get a psychology degree. Kind of realized I wanted to start trading, so I switched it over to finance. And after graduating college, I moved up to Chicago and walked onto the floor, started out as a runner, sold all my stocks, and bought myself a badge. Jumped into the pits, and I've been trading my own money ever since. Well, I was trading my own money in college, actually. Uh, but I've basically been in all market conditions. I've traded all of these products uh, and options as well. Uh, little disclaimer here, please take a moment to read over this. Basically it says anything that I say in this webinar should not be constituted as investment advice. It should be considered general commentary. The reason why I don't know your risk parameters. I don't know what's in your portfolios. Therefore, what I'm doing could be counterintuitive to what you're doing. So take what we're teaching you in these webinars and implement it into your portfolios in your own way. Uh, bottom line is do your own homework and please remember the past performance of any trading system or methodology is not necessarily indicative of future results. All right. So this is the short call and it's a naked short call. So you are going to need like level three options for this um, to be able to take part in this. I do have some ways that you can trade this in an IRA to make it synthetically um, like a short call. Basically, what we do is we go out and buy the first call we can for a nickel. And that's my rule on that. Sometimes those spreads get really wide, but it gets around the rules um, of it not being a defined risk. We are not going to ever take it to that uh, defined risk area, hopefully, but uh, or at least I would do everything in my power not to. Um, but short call, naked is what we're going to be looking at today, but I'll show you guys how to trade it in an IRA to make it IRA appropriate. All right. Our market assumption is bearish. OK, you can get away with it being market neutral. I would do something like a strangle or an iron condor if your assumption was market neutral. But what I want to say here is you will still have a winner even if the market stays neutral. And it could even slightly move higher if your bearish assumption is incorrect. You just don't want it to breach your short call uh, is what we're doing. But we can make money in just about either direction for the most part. And we're gonna be taking advantage of theta decay on this. And we want volatility to come out. We want volatility crush. That's the key to this strategy and really making money quickly. We wanna be in and out of this strategy rather fast. And if we get that volatility crush, we're going to get to that point rather quickly. All right. So let's go over a couple of rules. Essentials to success. All right. Before we ever even start thinking we're going to sell a short call, I don't want you guys just to go out there and start throwing short calls on everywhere. You need to have these essentials in order to be successful, because if you implement this strategy in the wrong environment, you are going to not be very happy. So I want to make it very clear. We want high implied volatility for that underlying. And what we're going to be looking at 
is implied volatility percent for any one line underlying, and it needs to be above 50. Okay, and I'll go through how to figure out implied volatility percent here in just a second. But for a stock, anything above 50, that's when we can start collecting premium. Uh, ETF, because it's a basket of goods, the volatility, you guys, is going to get kind of flattened out. It's going to meld in a sense because it's averaging. You know, some of those uh, stocks in that ETF may have very high volatility, but some of those other ones are going to have very low volatility. And you can see how that would average one another out. So that's kind of what an ETF does. Therefore, we are willing to lower our rule there for ETFs to be greater than 30% on that. All right. Uh, and I want to show you guys how to figure that out real quick. So if we look at this chart right here and it's Apple, okay. So we've got the Apple chart here. This is implied volatility. You can throw it on there, but it doesn't have the implied volatility percent. I have a column here on my platform that has implied volatility percent. So it does the math, but if you don't have that, or sometimes there's a break in the, uh, the chart here and it won't really calculate it. Uh, we don't have any of those issues here. It'll just say not app or NA on there. Um, but what we do, figure out implied volatility percent. You have a numerator and a denominator. In the numerator, we take where it currently is, trade or where volatility currently is now, which is let's say 30. You can see it's right there, 30. And we take that and subtract it from the low, which is uh, 14. Okay, so we have 16 in the numerator, all right? And then we divide that number by the sum of the de in the denominator, which is the high minus the low. And the high here is, uh, what is that? I'm going to need to get my glasses because it's on my other screen way away. Um, what is that? 32? Oh, 36. <laughs> 36 minus 14 is where we came up with 36 minus 14. So we're going to get uh, 22. So 16 divided by 22 um, is what our calculation is. So 16 divided by 22 equals 72%. So 73% is exact because they're going out to the decimal and they're nailing the number. I just did it as a ballpark, but you can see uh, obviously, that would fit that rule of having an implied volatility percent of greater than 50. All right. So that's what we're looking for. You can put it on your chart there or on your watch list or somewhere else, or you can throw it here. Another place you can find it, at least on uh, TOS, is to uh, close all this stuff down. And it'll be right here. It's usually a round. Uh, they round it for this purpose, but you can also find current implied volatility percentile. All right. So anything above 50 is what we're looking for. And that's the first step. If you're going to be selling this call, you need to have high implied volatility. The reason why we don't want to sell this in the low implied volatility environment, because when volatility expands, those premiums go up. OK, and we don't want to sell in low implied volatility because of the probability volatility we will go up. The idea when you're selling volatility, when it's really high, is that probability is it's going to revert back to the mean, okay? So that's what we're looking for. High implied volatility, revert back, uh, and we want to stay away from low implied volatility altogether. All right, so we look for a stock that has or uh, want to short something uh, and be bearish on it, or we're bearish on this underlying. First thing we need to know is does that stock have high implied volatility right and another thing to know when markets go down volatility has a tendency to creep up so um, even if we're in high implied volatility it may if we get our directional move it still may have volatility increasing on you and hurting you a little bit but that directionality will help and probably outpace that volatility increase all right picking the right underlying we have to have a tight bid ask on the stocks, you guys. I, I see this all the time. As a matter of fact, my good friends, uh, I'm not going to mention their names, but, you know, they were talking about uh, doing uh, an iron condor around AutoZone. And I think it's AZN. Um, it's not AZN. I can't remember what AutoZone is. I don't even have it on my watch list, to be quite honest. But really wide markets, okay? 
And it, don't get them. Everybody's heard of AutoZone, but there's nobody in these markets. Um, you know, you could, there's all kinds of stocks that will fall into that category where everybody's heard of them, but they're just not being traded. Um, uh, do you scan with particular criteria to develop your watch list? Uh, actually, my watch list, anything over here in the watch list should have type bid ask. So, for instance, you know, deer should have a type bid ask. And I go to the first monthly, the closest monthly to expiration, basically. And what I do is it should be 10 cents wide to bid ask. Now, if it's over $100 stock like deer, move it three ticks to the left, and it should be about 14, 15 cents wide, which this generally follows into that category, okay? So that is my rule of thumb. If it's under $100, uh, a stock that's under $100, let's just say uh, Gilead. Um, Gilead Science, under $100, we should have bid ask inside of 10 cents. So you can see that these fit that rule, all right? Gilead Science is probably a uh, less popular uh, household name than AutoZone, wouldn't you say? And these markets are going to be much better than AutoZone um, or something like that. But that's how I come up with my watch list. If it falls in to this category of type bid ask, it makes it to the watch list. If it doesn't, you know, if it's a nickel outside of it or something like that, you know, if it says I should say it should be 15 cents, maybe or 10 cents and it's 15 cents, um, I may bend that rule a little bit, but if you're a newer trader, for sure, stick to that rule and build from that. And then once you get more comfortable with pricing and options, then you can kind of start letting that be a little bit more wiggle room. But in the beginning, you guys, I really want you guys, uh, Ulta is another one that I kind of watch that doesn't always follow that rule. Um, but, you know, I'm pretty good about making good markets in there and I make them come to me. I'm not going to hit that bid or that offer because if I have to give up 60 cents to the downside and, you know, it decays at 16 cents a day, you know, I'm going to have to be in this for four days only to get a scratch. I've taken four days of risk only to scratch. And that is not worth it to me. And that's why I want the type bid ask is because I want to like a day or two to go by and, I've already gotten that theta decay to get me um, back to where my break even would be, where, which is, uh, oh, AZO. Thank you for somebody. Uh, thank you, Mary. AZO. Um, so you can see, look at this dollar. I mean, it's a big stock, but 60 cents wide is my rule on this. And this is, you know, over a dollar 40 or something like that. So to put in, or a dollar here, you know, that's just outside of anybody that it should be a newer trader because you're going to give up, you're going to get slaughtered by these guys making these markets, okay? There's only a few people going to be in here trading this, and those guys can make the market whatever they want. You know, if there's only, if it's just you, you have the only market in something, you can make that market whatever you want. But then we go to look at something like Apple, um, and uh, there's so many people in here trading that they're almost falling over each other to make a better market. You know, you have a position in Apple. I have a position, that person, that person, that person. There's a huge group in here trying to make markets and get their strikes uh, at the price they want that they're willing to give up a penny here. And another guy gives up a penny and somebody else gives up a penny. And, you know, it's that real free market price discovery happening. Whereas, uh, you know, it's still free market price discovery in something like AutoZone, but you're going to have to give up way too much edge to get it out now. So stay away from that, especially in the beginning. And I, I stay away from it even now. I'm, I don't even have AutoZone's not even on my watch list. Uh, but I just saw that example happen not too long ago. So I wanted to make sure you guys are clear of that concept. Make sure type bid asks. And that's during the day. We're after on a Friday and uh, probably a early rush to the Hamptons and there wasn't a whole lot of volume. Picking the right duration. Now we're in a real sweet spot here right now because we have like 21 days to expiration. You can go inside of this. I like to default back here because 
this 45 days to 35 days to expiration is my real sweet spot. I will go inside of this, don't get me wrong, uh, but once it starts getting less than 30 days to expiration, I like to go out a little bit further. And right now we're kind of at that where um, you're gonna have to make a decision. Do I wanna go further in duration, which is gonna get you further away from where the underlying is trading. And then you get this theta decay. These are the at the monies. We aren't going to be dealing with at the money. So our theta decay chart will look a little bit different. Uh, so we can all debate that, but this gives you a good idea as to how theta affects the premiums the closer to duration so or closer to expiration sorry but you can see 50 percent drop in those premiums inside of these 28 days now i don't like to go inside of really even 14 days necessarily and i definitely would like to be out outside of seven or uh if it's getting close to seven days all right uh, if you're inside in this trade still um you are really probably having a trade that's uh, testing your strikes. Uh, and if it does that, we'll talk about ways to trade around that as well. But try and get out here. I'm going to probably be talking mostly around the 45 days to expiration, uh, but you can go inside of this. Uh, I would be very quick to cover this trade uh, at like 50% of my max profit. And I'll, I'll talk to, about that a little bit further. I'm going to be looking for that even on the 45 days to expiration. 50, maybe squeeze out 60, 75% of max profit. I'm not going to ride. I'm not the guy that rides this into the sunset, you guys. I know a lot of people will teach and say, just take it to expiration. I don't do that. I don't like the gamma risk and all that other stuff that's going on inside of seven days. You know, there's big money in there trying to push that stock around to get their strikes. I just, I don't want to be involved in that game. Uh, I'd rather just take my money out here and let the big boys play there, All right? Uh, do you only use at the money strike for the spread calculation or, or if it applies to any strike you consider? Um, if we're talking about creating a spread out of a naked sh short, call synthetic strategy where I'm buying that first nickel. Is that what you're talking about where I mentioned that earlier? Or are you talking about this theta decay? I'm gonna, uh, that was for the 10 cents. I'm not sure. Um, try and uh, explain that a little bit better for me, please, Dominic. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about this for the most part, but. Don't go too far out. Yeah, you will be able to get further away, but you're gonna be sitting on that trade for a long time because you can see theta is not going to decay very quickly. And something to know, why do we wanna get involved in a high implied volatility environment? Because what happens is implied volatility starts expanding. What happens is this kind of whoop goes out a little bit and it flattens. That doesn't allow theta to come out. And then when volatility comes out, this is why we used to call it volatility crush because it goes that happens to your premiums to catch up. So we want to be involved here. And when we get that volatility crush, get out early. So that's why you really want to get in when it's high implied volatility because it's starting to flatten out. You don't want to get in when that volatility starts expanding on you. All right. Uh, rule for bid ask. Oh, sorry. Yes. You use the at the money. Yes, Dominic. Correct. We want, Dominic's asking, do we use the at the money to determine that, that 10 cents? And yes, I use the at the monies or the closer to the at the monies. Uh, these will all work, you know, up to like a 16 delta. Uh, any of these will work. I don't really look at the ones that are in the money for that rule, okay? Rule is the ones that are just out of the money. Okay, that answer your question? All right, picking the right strikes. Well, we've, we've seen this before, right? This is basically the bell curve and it gives probabilities, right? And we can argue that a bell curve, uh, if I still have my pen up, I don't think it does. A bell curve could look like this and then have a little bit of skew to it, right? Or, um, or it could look like this and come up and then have more skew to it to that side, right? Uh, where the line would be kind of like that, 
uh, on this because 50% is over here, 50% and up. Of course, that's not exact. But at the end of the day, what we're looking for is a one standard deviation move, meaning that 84% of the time, the underlying will land in this area, okay? About 16% of the time, it'll come up this area, all right? That's pretty good probabilities, right? Probability of success, you have a 84% probability of success here, right? 100%, take a 16% probability of it landing over here. That means you have an 85% probability of success. So you got in here, that's what I was talking about. It can move against you and you can still make money. We definitely want it to go this way, but it can go down or it can move against us, let's say, even though this is a little bit backwards, just know that it can go against you. We're looking for the 16 delta in that case because delta correlates the probabilities, you guys. So in that, uh, if we were looking at the charts, we're gonna be kind of looking at Apple and we're gonna start looking at the 16 delta, right? Right here. This would be a 15 delta, which means it's an 85% probability that I am going to be successful because the delta tells us that the probability of this underlying being at 175.01, that means $175 and one penny at expiration of this product is a 15% probability, right? Trader hack is two times the delta is the probability of being tested during this 21 days or 45 days, whatever day you pick. You can just know a floor trader hack is two times the delta is the probability of being touched. So now you know your probabilities of your success, right? You know the probabilities of success are much greater than the probability of being tested on this underlying. So you can hold solace in it. When you come up, you know, well, I got about a 30% probability of this coming up here and testing me. So those little nuances will help you stay mechanical and psychology. Remember, I mentioned psychology in the beginning. That was going to be my major. It ended up not being my major, but I still basically took enough classes for a minor in it. And in that, staying mechanical is really what's going to make you successful in trading and not getting emotional. And some of these little trader hacks and things that I talk about will bring that to light. You know, when this market's moving against you, you just look at it and say, you know what, it's, it's going up, but the probabilities are it's not going to finish there and it may test me, you know, and I'll, I'll show you some different ways that you can throw some trades around it when you're getting tested, especially, you know, if it happened towards, uh, you know, the end of the expiration cycle where it starts coming into this area and all of a sudden this trade starts going against you. I'll show you some ways to uh, play around with that to fix that. Okay. Um, but we're going to be looking for this 16 delta to start and then we'll play around with it from there. One thing with that picking the right strike, don't, you know, and we're picking that 16 delta. If it, if you're paying less or you're getting paid less than 30 cents for that 16 delta, I would move on. There's just too much risk for the reward at that point, all right? Just move away from it, find something different to uh, trade with it. I've sold the naked put, but never a call. Uh, what are my consequences? I will learn. <laughs> uh, yeah, you're, a lot of people will do that, sell puts instead of selling calls, because you know they feel the market's always gonna go up, but there is always a bearish market somewhere, you guys. You don't always have to pick the stocks that are always going up. You can capitalize on the ones that are going down as well. And I implore you to do that because if you are always directionally biased to the upside, you are not properly hedged. You always need counter opposing deltas. And if you are always delta long, then uh, you are really at the mercy of the market. And the same for if you're always delta short, you're at the mercy of the market. But always try and mix, sprinkle in, you know, 
long deltas with short deltas, okay? I'm not necessarily saying you need to be delta neutral because if you're a bullish long-term assumption in the market, you want to be delta long, but look for some of those counterposing ones to allow you to get a little bit short and take advantage of that as well. So you, if there is a correction, you can still at least capitalize on that. And we're seeing a more volatile market. So you have to really start being more conscious of that. We're not just seeing that straight move that we saw before. All right. And knowing our exit strategy. All right. We're selling a short call at a 16 Delta. You know, I want you to collect at least 30 cents or more. And if you can't collect that 30 cents or more, kind of move on because after commissions and everything else, it's going to be hard. Um, but knowing your exit strategy, I like to go at around 50% of my max profit on an underlying. You know, if you're in a smaller account and you're only able to trade maybe one or uh, two calls in this, uh, you definitely need it to be above 30 uh, if you're only doing one call. And if you're only doing one call, you're going to probably have to take about 75% of your max profit if it's only about 30 cents. Otherwise, I'm going for 50% of my max profit. All right. Uh, every once in a while, I will squeeze it out for a little bit more. But I'll tell you, the times where I'm kind of getting getting to that point of being able to squeeze it out for more, it's usually because volatility is starting to really come off and I'm able to get out of it uh, for better than 50% of my max profit. All right. Yeah, uh, we'll look over that, Banu. Um, remind me, in, the, in a minute here, I'm going to be telling people to throw out some, uh, give me some stocks that we'll look through and run through those uh, rules to see if it fits the strategy. All right, so, and that goes for everybody. So start thinking of your stocks and don't pick AutoZone. <laughs> All right, so max profit. Anytime we're selling premium, okay? Anytime you collect a premium, that is your max profit, all right? Is the premium received? Max loss on this. Yes, it is a short call. Your uh, risk is unlimited. So this isn't a strategy where you want to just put on and come back in 45 days to see how it did, all right? This is something where you're going to be keeping a pretty close eye on, all right? And um, well, I'll talk about remind. Uh, I'll talk about exit strategy here in a second. Give me one more minute. All right. Break even is the underlying price. When the underlying price is trading just above that short call strike of yours, plus the premium. So if we pick the 100 calls and we collected a dollar, then our break even is when the underlying is trading at 101. OK, so it's just a short strike plus the premium because that premium gives us a buffer to the upside. All right. All right, so this is where we're pulling up the platform. So throw out some stocks for uh, for us to go over to just kind of, you know, uh, see if it fits the fits all the rules. All right, first one I saw was Banu's with GE. All right, so we're gonna first thing we need to look for does it have high implied volatility percent? Nah, it's a little below 50. Okay, um, we also don't want to do this with the earnings. Uh, coming up in the cycle we're selling. So this that would work. Uh, if you really expected uh, volatility to start coming out even more, you know, I wouldn't be, you know, beating up on you about it because we've experienced really high implied volatility for this year. But having said that, you can see it's at the low volatility area of 2018 for the most part, which is where we've started to experience high implied volatility. So I might uh, look at that as being almost at zero implied volatility percent. If we just took like the last few months from here to here, you could do that math. And I do have friends that trade on implied volatility percent that only look at the last six months. They don't care about the whole year. I look at the whole year. But I, you know, just stay consistent. If you go with that and you want to go with like the last six months only, which, uh, you know, I think is probably a pretty good idea considering we've stayed elevated for at four months so far. Um, so I would not be uh, one to say don't do that. But I do have friends that look only six months back 
and figure that implied volatility percent, I go the whole year. Okay. <clears throat> so with that example, um, do you need to cover the short call if the current price is 99 and your strike is 100 taking the $1 premium? Um, no. So what I do is I, I allow it to go to my break even or, and that is where if it goes to my break even, I'm usually going to be a little bit more uh, aggressive and I'll probably sell like a put or something like that against it. Because if I sell a put against it, that increases my break even even more because I've collected more credit. Right. I have increased my risk a little bit more to the downside as well. But I've also uh, taken away some of my risk to the upside. Now, that would be also if you're still bearish in your market assumption, you thought it was going to come back and wouldn't test your short puts in that remaining time. But um, I, I usually pick levels where I'm going to say, hey, you know, this is where I pull the ripcord on it. And I use Fibonacci and stuff like that. Do I have my Fibonacci up? So you could throw something up like that. And, you know, if I sold calls against it, let's just say, for example, I was able to sell the call above this Fibonacci level. Um, I would do that uh, and say, you know, as soon as it breaks this fib, then that's when I'm out. One thing about GE that I do like, uh, ben, Benu, is that it's right here at the point of control where the most time and volume has been spent, which means it's going to want to settle down here. It's because people who are long and short have uh, are long and short right here. And when you're long or short where the underlying is trading, there's no stress, right? There's stress when you have a winning trade on because you're constantly thinking, do I cover it yet? And you're stressed when you're losing on it, right? But there's no stress right here. So it's like the happy place. It's where everybody settles down and nobody makes any more moves because they've already got it on right here, all right? Um, so having said that, you know, if you thought it was gonna settle down right here or go test these lows, um, you know, you could look at doing that for GE. OK, another one I saw was uh, Procter and Gamble, who everyone in this space is uh, has not been having a fun 2018, to say the least. But I guess millennials don't eat cereal. Um, but this is in a very bearish trend. They already had the uh, earnings come out as well. I don't see them really coming back from this anytime soon. It is. It was above 50 earlier today. Um, so, you know, you could say that it's still going to continue to come out, but uh, you can sell some puts in there. So let's look at this one. Um, tight bid ask, uh, has a high implied volatility, let's say. Uh, tight bid ass, 10 cents wide. We can even look at the 45 days to expiration here to get a little further uh, up in a way on this underline. So I'd kind of like to be at least up here maybe up here, because if it does come back, I think it, it'll it settle down here. If it tries to cover this little gap, um, should find resistance on the 50 day moving average, all of those things. So if I could sell the 80 uh, calls, I would do that. So you wouldn't be able to do that here. The 80 calls here, I wouldn't really be able to do that e either. I'd probably have to go closer to the 75. So I'd probably stay away from this because I would want to collect at least 30 cents and you can't get the 16 delta on this one. I don't want to sell it that close at the 75s. I don't think it's just a little too tight for me because that's right where the gap wants to cover. Of course, that one could say that there's resistance there, but uh, I would just, I think I'm going to walk away on that. Money flow is still very negative. You're right. It is flowing out, uh, but um, I'm probably just going to stay away from it. it. Just I can't get enough premium to get up here because that's like 775. That would be basically my break even on that. So uh, I'm going to look at something else then. Uh, let's look at Adobe. I think Adobe has been in a bull market though. Oh, dyslexia, I guess. Um, all right. So I've got on the fibs. I've got on the extensions here. Uh, and it has three times hit the top. Third time through is our our little rule on the floor, it did break through there, but it failed. So um, I'm looking at it like it's not going to uh, to make it through there again. 
has earnings coming up in that 45 day cycle. So on this one, I'm going to lean towards uh, the shorter duration on it. And I'm going to look at what is this trade now? 240. So I'm going to be looking for the 240 calls to get above that Fibonacci level uh, at least. So the 240 calls are easily there. Uh, that's on the one with the earnings on it. So I'm going to stay away from that one. So let's go to the 240 calls. That's the 11 Delta, um, 237 and a half calls and collect a nice little premium there. 237. God, I can get through 37 and a half calls. That's pretty good. I'm going to go with that. I would go with that one. 16 Delta, uh, right here, collect a dollar on the 237 and a half calls. It fits the rule. You can see Adobe. $200 stock, move the decimal three ticks to the left, 22 cents is how wide the bid ask should be. And we're uh, inside of that 15 cents wide. That's a good market. So uh, we put that in. One thing also to note, uh, most trading platforms do this because think about it. Their incentive is to get you filled, right? It's not to get you filled at the best price. It's to get you filled. And what we used to say on the floor, it's fill them and bill them. Right? And that's their mantra. They don't care about the price or anything else. They just want your commission. So if I go to sell this uh, strike here, you'll see if my computer will figure it all out, that it's trying to default me to the bid. And remember what I talked about? When there's a lot of volume and open interest and you start having tighter markets, just better the market. I would come up here and I'd probably offer this at 98 which is, uh, let's say, and that's the mid market on that. Uh, so a dollar is the offer. So 98 cents, you know, I'd probably start out there, go with two pennies inside of that, maybe one penny. It doesn't cost you guys anything to cancel and replace. Put that order in there. I'm not saying sit there for 15 minutes. If you decided you're bearish on this, you're probably a little bit trigger happy, but don't cost yourself a bunch of money going in there and selling the 91s when you could sell, you know, 95 or 96s or 90 sell for 96 cents. You know, that's that's covering your commissions. And over the long term, by doing that, you guys, your yield is going to be a lot better. I mean, those little pennies will add up over time. And if you can sell it better for the commissions, I mean, uh, go for it. So put that in there, you know, wait basically long enough to go in and see if the market's changed at all, see if anybody's bid it up a little bit, and then cancel replace until you get filled, all right? Uh, Baidu, or, uh, Banu says, uh, but Adobe, prior to earnings, IV will be rising, and it will, and it is. As you can see here, this volatility is going up, but it's not going up as much as this one is, and this the volatility, implied volatility, isn't going to affect this one as much as the one that has the earnings in it. And that's why it is going to go up because of those earnings. OK. Uh, is the 16 delta and the 30 cents guidelines the same for selling covered calls? Uh, not for selling covered calls necessarily, because covered calls, I'm going to ride that out a little bit longer. But uh, for the short calls, because, you know, in that. Covered calls, Chuck, when the market's moving higher and making money on that stock underlying, right? So I'm not nearly as concerned about it. With this, uh, 30, less than 30 cents to me is just not worth the risk reward. Okay. So try and at least collect more than 30 cents. And, you know, you're going to have to play with a little bit higher price stock. Like uh, GE is, is not going to be able to... Uh, get you that 30 cents because it's such a low price stock. And I would never sell GE at a 14 cent anyway, but or at $14 stock because there's just way too much risk to the upside for that as well. Uh, I would find different ways to play that to the downside on that. Right. Um, okay. So, so Procter and Gamma, we did uh, Adobe. Uh, what was the other one? Caterpillar. Somebody threw out on Caterpillar, so let's take a look at it. 
All right, Caterpillar is $144 stock. So my rule here, I'll round it up 15 cents, right? Uh, you can see Caterpillar's inside of that. It's 10 cents all day long. All right, when's their earnings? They just came out with their earnings. Does it have a high implied volatility percent? It's pretty close. The ones that are way up here are the ones that have earnings in them, you know, and that's what Banu was talking about is that when you have earnings, that implied volatility gets jacked, and it does. But And you will be able to find some, like, as a matter of fact, I know a lot of these were higher today for the uh, implied volatility, but, you know, with nothing going on in the market today, it all started coming out. But let's look at Caterpillar for this trade. Uh, the market, they didn't come up with very good forward guidance. So I have a feeling the market's going to at least stay bearish. It's very close to this point of control, uh, which is for the time. It doesn't mean a lot of volume has been traded there, but it's been time. So people have gotten used to seeing that number. So it's not a scary number anymore. It's kind of like if, if you had a loser on it, it just always traded right here. You kind of, all right, well, I kind of know where, where I'm at anyway, but it's a little bit bearish, I would say. Um, so let's look at it. Uh, where would we want to be on this trade? I'd like to throw up the Fibonacci's because uh, it just gives you a little bit of an idea of where we're going. So it's going to be pretty high. So I would probably look at something like this for my, actually, you know what? I'd probably look at this as my resistance. That's a couple of times up there. So I want to at least be above 161. I've got a bunch of resistance for this to get through. It looks like it's very close to settling below this, which would even be better for me. So uh, I'm going to be trying to look at something like 175. And this is what I go through every time I put on a trade, you guys. This is how I go through these steps, trying to figure out where my risk is, where I want to get my location. And if it doesn't work out that great, then I'm going to kind of move on. So 160, I want to at least be above to be feeling really comfortable about this trade. Uh, the 16 delta is um, 155. Um Where's 155? 155 puts me right there at the point of control where I think it's going to settle down right against that resistance. I'll take that risk. I'll give it up a little bit more. So that's where I would I would be looking to get it into here at 16 delta. I'm comfortable with getting right there at that resistance area as well. And I see a bunch of people throwing out some questions, I think, uh, that I may have missed. So let me go over there. With CAD, does the volatility, uh, or the volume profile, P point of control so far below current price matter at 107. Dominic, uh, I usually will go with uh, when it's that far away, it's really kind of lost uh, a bit of its strength. I mean, that was back early on in uh, almost a full year ago uh, where all of that volume traded and that was mostly due to, you know, value, uh, finding value in it. So, I'm more inclined to go for this one. Uh, you know, they, they right here, you are going to be more comfortable, but here everybody's kind of gotten used to it. So they're more comfortable as well, or they're comfortable as well with that. Cause if you've lost money and it's always trading there, you're kind of like, oh yeah, well I've already, you kind of forget about it a little bit more. Um, but I'm a little bit bearish on Caterpillar right now. Cause I'm, if you've watched my daily market commentaries that I've been talking uh, constantly about, we're seeing some, global emerging market slowdown and not, I'm not saying we're in contraction territory, but we are not seeing the expansion we would like to see for a robust global economy uh, turnaround. United States, we're doing all right. I feel the Fed is doing us an injustice right now. I think they're moving rate or talking about moving rates a little bit too quickly for the type of environment we're in. We're, we're also seeing that some of our uh, data points aren't coming in as high as expected. It's not contraction, don't get me wrong, but we're just not seeing the robust you know, economy we thought we were going to be seeing uh, towards the later half of 2018. I mean, if you're watching any of these earnings, you hear all of these guys are coming out with better earnings. And if you watch my daily market commentaries, I'm talking about them because I've been playing it to the upside on the expectations of better earnings, but their forward guidance is killing us. But having said that, we have to know that forward guidance um, because you know they have their thumbs on the pulse, right? So 
make sure you um, don't pass that opportunity up. So they gave out bad forward guidance because I was in that trade <laughs> um, and know that as well. So I'm going to look for this 16 delta. That's where I'm going to go. It's pretty simple, you guys. Oh, um, so what do we do if this market starts trading up and testing us and you're getting a little nervous, all right? Uh, you can go in and sell a put, all right? I wouldn't sell it too close to where you're, I wouldn't create necessarily a strangle right away, but make it a little bit like, or sorry, make it a straddle, which is the same strike, but make it a tight strangle. So you still have a little bit of wiggle room in there, all right? So if the market trades up there and this was my put right now, or my, my short call, let's say I did it 20 days ago and I'm up here getting tested, I got 21 days to go, you know, I could look at it as my probabilities of being tested are greater and it could come down. My market assumption was still bearish, then I would probably leave it. Uh, if I was a little bit nervous and it kind of came to that point of control where we were talking about and it, now I'm thinking, all right, it's going to settle down here and I could finish slightly in the money, but I don't want it to be a loser. Then you could go and sell like a uh, 16 Delta or something like that. And you could get it even more aggressive. I like to start out with a 16 Delta. And then um, if that starts decaying, you know, maybe roll it up a little bit, collect a little bit more premium if it started to continue to move higher until I got to a straddle if it continued up, all right? And um, if you were still bearish uh, in that market assumption, you're just like, hey, this is just a brief blip um, and they're pushing it against me. You can roll it out in time too. Take that whole strategy, just roll it out in time and collect more premium. If you do roll it out in time and you can't collect any more premium really than just walk away, pull the ripcord on it or, um, you know, wait till those last couple of days. All right. Uh, sorry. Uh, do you avoid, uh, do I avoid potential? Yes. I would definitely avoid a potential takeover target, like say months, Santo or something like that. As a matter of fact, I would avoid selling Under Armour right now uh, because I have a feeling Lulu's uh, chomping at the bit to, or sorry, champing at the bit to uh, buy them out. Uh, and short squeezes, uh, if you start feeling like you're getting in a short squeeze, just pull the ripcord and get out. All right, at one, the 155 Caterpillar uh, was it the 16 Delta and what credit was received? So in Caterpillar, we were looking. No, we didn't go with the uh, 16 Delta. It was pretty close, though, the 15, uh, the 14 Delta. I'm just going to kind of start there at that 16 Delta. And I'd obviously like to get further away. So that's why I rolled out rather than tighter. Uh, why start at the, uh, Chris is asking, why start at the 16 Delta? Because... Uh, the 16 Delta, for one, is a one standard deviation move, okay? And when we talk about the bell curve, that means there's only a 16% probability that it will land above our strike price and an 85% probability that it will land away from our strike price, okay? So that's why we're looking at that one standard deviation move. And it will be, it will be defended. Okay. Um, does anybody else have any other real quick questions? But I don't have a problem if it comes up here, especially if there was only like 21 days to expiration and I was getting tested on there to go in and throw another put in there or to throw a put in there and make a big strangle out of it. I'm always about collecting more premium. Okay. Okay, so for instance, if I sold this, somebody's asking if I can review how I can defend it. Um, if, you know, 45 days to expiration, you know, I went out here and I sold this 14 Delta and I'm like, all right, fine. Now, 28 days have gone by, but all it's done is just slowly crept up. And I'm not able to really get to 50% of my max profit and 
uh, now I'm being tested. So this is going to be worth, you know, a dollar or you know, it's going to be worth a couple of dollars, maybe even. So at that point, then I would go in here and try and throw on a put to try and cover some of that, increase my break even to the upside by that amount that I sell. But I would try to make it a little bit wider market. And I might not go as far out as the 16 Delta, depending on my assumption. But, I, you know, it wouldn't be a bad start to get there. Uh, and then that gives you the opportunity to roll after, you know, maybe a week or something like that. Roll to a higher strike or uh, roll it right into a strangle. OK, so we're always kind of defending it that way since there's no you wouldn't want to buy a call to define that risk up here at that point, um, because if you your market assumption was correct still and it went down, then that, that call is going to crush you uh, that you bought. And if it continues up, then that defined risk is, uh, you know, is, is not going to make you very happy. If you can sell this, collect some premium to increase your break even, I think you'll be much happier. Okay. Uh, Ted, I was out all our name just got in. Uh, yes, you will get a replay hopefully today. Thanks Paris. Appreciate your kind words. Um, all right. I think I got everybody. All right. Is everybody, is everybody clear concept before I uh, move along here? Pretty simple to understand, like I said, um, strangle uh, strangle is a long put and a long call. Well, a strangle can be a, a, a long strangle is a long put and a long call. A short strangle is a short put and a short call. So we would be creating a short strangle in that situation. That makes sense? All right. Good. Cool. All right, guys, this is the uh, offer we're giving you. Basically, it's options courses. This is a uh, an options course for beginners. Basically, it's a, it'll help catch you up. If you guys are, I see a lot of new faces out there or at least a lot of new names. Uh, if you miss some of those beginner courses and you're newer to trading, this is a phenomenal course right here. It has really the essentials for any newer trader. I even go into the history of options where Aristotle talked about this guy and you can learn about him. Pretty amazing uh, story. Basically a guy going uh, from having nothing to being a very, very wealthy man. Um, and income generation with options, things of that nature. I'm gonna be briefly going over some of those. Um, and for 36 bucks, you can't beat it. Now I always say this, you guys, you know, you already already taken the first step by trying to learn. And that's the best way to become a better trader is constantly learning. So uh, wouldn't you say that you can go out there and figure out how to do a short call online? Yes, of course you can. I'm not going to lie to you, but they aren't going to have these rules. They're not going to tell you how to get out of it. They're not going to tell you when you should be getting out of it. Most of these people that are teaching people how to trade options tell people to write, and they're always talking about their winners, but they're always writing them into the end of the day. And I think that that's too much risk. There's just a lot of things going on in the last week of options expiration that I think that especially beginner traders should stay away from. So basically, uh, technical trading helps, knowing that how to trade the options helps, but staying mechanical is really where it's at. And uh, if you really wanna get ahead in this game, it, the best way to do that is to trade with probabilities and know the probabilities in and out because that will make you become more mechanical. You won't trade with that emotion, you guys. And that is the one thing that will take any trader down is allowing their emotions to get the best of them. And if there's anything that I learned in my, I, I think my psychology degree actually helped me out trading more than my, uh, my finance degree, to be quite honest. But um, increasing your probabilities of success. Anybody can tell you how to build this strategy, obviously. But I teach you guys how to trade with probabilities. And when the probabilities have gone against us, 
how to stay mechanical, like selling that put, you know, nobody else is going to teach you how to trade around a loser because they only talk about their winners. They're only going to sit there and give you examples of their winners. And I implore you guys to watch my daily market commentaries because I talk about every single trade. I tell you the day I put it on. So I am accountable, right? And I tell you when I'm taking it off, I'm accountable. I tell you the winners and the losers every single time. Um, I'm not going to sugarcoat anything. I'm, you guys will be going through all of this stuff with me if you're watching those. So basically, when you guys are using the right tools in the right situation, you're going to be more productive state of mind. And that will allow you guys to put on more strategy, which creates more opportunities. And the more opportunities is really where it's at. You know, uh, because like I said, these earnings trades, I'm trying to put on as many, pro any trade, as many trades as I can to increase my probabilities of success. I don't care how sure you guys are that some, your directional assumption is right. Do not, do not put most of your portfolio value in any one asset. I don't care how sure you are. Uh, my rule is, you know, less than 10% of your portfolio value should be in any one uh, underlying. Okay. That's another little tidbit that's not really in on this. But um, anyway, we're offering this today for you guys. I suggest you take advantage of it. It's in the chat window. We've been going back and forth in the questions box. I threw it over there in the chat window for you so you can just click on it. If you're watching this on tape delay, you're just going to have to pause and punch this into the URL like I did. Here, I typed this in myself. So uh, I should give you this right here, all of these uh, different uh, webinars. There's even several more. So you're getting like over 10 hours of webinars with this one. And protecting your portfolio against rising interest rates, you guys. Uh, your bond portfolio, most people have 40, 50% of their assets in bonds you're going to get decimated and you cannot chase a higher coupon. It doesn't work. The portfolio value will be much less than that amount you will be able to recoup. Okay. And that's because the guys pricing it know where to price it so that you can't. And there's only one way to beat that, uh, to increase those coupons. And I show you how to do that in there. I see a couple of questions coming up here also, but let me, I'll get to those questions. Give me one second. Um, to finish this up, you guys can reach out to us at 310-598-6677 or trading at protraderstrategies.com. Um, if you guys have learned anything at all from me today, I suggest you guys take advantage of this. Um, and you guys should be really trading with this knowledge. So what do you say? Go ahead and click on that link that's in that box over there and I'll get you set up right away. Uh, finally, if you can't take that, take it easy. That was a card hitting the wall. All right, uh, let me get over to some of these questions real quick and um, and then I'll get on with it. Uh, let's say, generally what strategies are involved in, Bob, oh, in, in the protecting your portfolio against rising interest rates? Uh, it's basically doing different types of uh, option strategies around it uh, because what happens is that, you know, as interest rates go up, you basically look at it like an, a teeter-totter, you guys. As interest rates go up, bond values go down, okay? The reason why those bond values go down is because the interest rate's going up, right? Um, and you're going to see that happening. Um, why not make the same trade three or four times for a higher return with the same time uh, same time you make the 140 or so days out. Brian, can you uh, rephrase that a little bit? Uh, why not make the same trade three or four times for a higher return within the same time? Oh, you're saying like get in, get out, get in, get out on that same one. I, I've done that before, Bob, uh, Brian. Um, you know, when the market continues to do that, I, I'll roll it down and continue to collect more premium. And I have no problem doing that. If your call is, uh, you know, say at 50% of max value and you're like, it's going to continue to go down. I, it just broke this Fibonacci level or it just broke this support level or whatever. Yeah. Roll that call down. I have no problem with that. Collecting more credit when your assumption is still the same. 
and I've, I've done that as well. So I, I don't have any problem to do that. Um, oh, wait, uh, just to be sure to make it okay for IRA, sell another call at a nickel, buy another call. So yes, thank you for reminding me. I'll go over that real quick. Hopefully we didn't lose a lot of people. Um, but anyway, so for instance, Caterpillar, what I would do in this, if it was my IRA, I was saying I was going to sell this 155s, then I would just look for the first one I could buy for a nickel. I'm probably not going to be able to buy this one for a nickel because I'd have to buy the bid. But mid-market nickel right here, that's where I would do it. And it will be IRA appropriate because they just recognize it as a spread. Do not, do not, do not let that give feel like it, it's a safety net. All right. It's not. You, you are going to want to get out well before that. OK. Um, as a matter of fact, I'd probably be getting out when it hit the next strike higher. So if it was if I was trying to stay in this at 14, I'd probably get out when it hit that other resistance area and broke through there. I would be probably out well before that anyway. But, you know, that could be a rule where you go to the next strike or something like that. So do not do that. It's just basically, you know, to get around. Uh, those people that made regulations that really didn't know what they were talking about. <laughs> my, my two cents on regulations and IRA is that it, it, I believe the regulations that uh, they have put on IRAs actually causes you to take on or uh, have more risk when you're doing options. Yes, you can do this in an IRA. You can just buy any call and all it does is say, well, it's defined risk. So just go out and buy it for a nickel. I do that all the time. And uh, I talk about that in the daily market commentaries, especially during earnings and stuff like that, too, because I trade out. You guys, I trade out of my IRA in, uh, and talk about that in my IRA. So I have a margin account and an IRA and I trade out of both of them. So um, if you guys like trading out of your IRA, watch that, too. Uh, yes, Ted, you should be getting a replay today. I know you get, didn't get yours last time, but you should be getting one today. All right. That's all I got for you guys today. Have a great weekend. Make sure you click on that link so you can take advantage of that. And if you guys haven't been watching those daily market commentaries, I'm telling you, I talk about every strategy I put on all day long. So, uh, you can trade a lot. Uh, well, you, uh, can watch what I'm doing in those because <laughs> it is not investment advice. All right. All right. If you can't take that, take it easy, guys. Have a great weekend. Bye now. Thank you, guys. I appreciate your kind words. Take care.